It's My Right Stuff with your host, Grammy Award winning record producer and inventor, Toby Wright. Brought to you by Tones, a natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tones.com. That's www.taummhoms.com. I'm your announcer, Grinnin Barrett. Here's Toby. Hey, hey, and welcome back to My Right Stuff. If you're not familiar with us, This is a film, TV, sports, adventure, lifestyle podcast, and our guests come from all walks of life, not just the music sector. I'm your host, Lord Toby Wright, and my co-host is Mr. Gareth Dighton, a.k.a. DJ Chunky from Chunky's Choice Cuts, all the way from Wales. Hey, Gareth, how are you doing today? Not too bad, actually, Toby. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Well, on today's podcast... It's actually stopped raining here. It has? So you're kidding. It ha- No, it has. We've actually had three days of sunshine. Oh, man. Get out the bikini, right? I, w- I was beginning to think, uh, well, to be fair, I was beginning to think the next time I saw you, I'd have gills and a fin. But uh, <laughs> luckily, it hasn't. It's, luckily, it's, it's not going to come to that just yet. Not just yet, anyway. Well, hopefully it won't. Not just yet. Because, you know, it's a, I, I need it. to send you a, you know, a scuba tank or something. You would indeed, yeah. <laughs> you'd have to... You'd, and, and actually kind of and then you'd have to get the logo emblazoned on actually the side of the tank as well right of course have to <laughs> you know just my right stuff little tank there for you to survive absolutely well as you know gareth on today's podcast we have a very special guest and his name is mitch gaylord uh, but first i want to thank our sponsor tomes uh, which is a natural sleep and sound healing portal helping people globally get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer through www.tomes.com. That's www.t-a-u-m-m-h-o-m-s.com. But, but Toby, most of all, a big thank you to all who stream, download, watch, and support My Right Stuff. Keep spreading the word, you mm. beautiful people. Be sure to click on the show notes below, uh, by which way you will find a link to my show, Chunky's Choice Cuts, which goes out live on Jack's Radio, but it also goes out on Radio Free Sealand. And follow our link tree for a full list of all the channels we are streaming on, as well as our sites and social media platforms. Uh, also, if you're able, please feel free to follow and support uh, the links to donate to My Right Stuff. Every single dollar helps to keep us on air and it goes to support the crew who make all of this possible. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel, as well as podcast channel of your choice, so you never get to miss a single episode and also find out what's coming next well gareth as you know today's guest is mitch gaylord and he's a gold silver and bronze medalist in the 84 olympic games he's considered by many the seventh best gymnast in the u.s ever and a movie star in his own right but he's been in such popular films as american anthem and a stuntman in mortal Kombat and batman forever wow how you doing mitch doing great good to be with you guys good to be with you thanks for being here Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So you grew up in Southern California. Uh, what what sports did. did you start in as a child? Well, initially I did the Little League and, you know, no Pop Warner, but I did flag football and a little bit of basketball. But I think baseball was my first love. And then uh, I didn't really start gymnastics until I was around 11 and a half or 12 years old. And that was through a trampoline class at, at the lo- local L.A. Valley College. And that's how I got into it. Nice. And while you were at uh, UCLA, you were an NCAA champion multiple times. You won the U.S. championships mm. multiple times. Can you expand upon that? Like, that's a great feat. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I had a great uh, time at UCLA. It was uh, my dad went there, so I was super excited uh, to be going there as well. Um you know, you say started on trampoline at 12 years old. So there was a lot of a big span of time between 12 and 17 and a half, 18 years old when I got to UCLA. Um, so that was a very, very interesting journey. But by the time I got to UCLA, I would say 
it went from being a recreational type of sport for me to a really serious one where I wanted to go to the Olympics and I wanted to do really well in college. And that's really when I started training hard. I was going about probably five hours a day and six days wow. a week and loving every minute of it though. Uh, mm. Cause you know, when you're doing what you love to do, it doesn't feel like work. It's just a passion that you have. And I had great coaches there, great teammates. And it was just a perfect environment to, to excel and get better and better. And, uh, you know, we ended up winning the NC2As as a team in 1984, which was a, a pretty big deal for UCLA. We had never done it before. And uh, it was just an all around great experience being there and doing the sport of gymnastics. Awesome. Um, awesome. You just mentioned briefly your Olympic experience. Obviously, you won gold, mm -hmm. two silvers and a bronze. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's better than I ever expected to do. Um, I, I would have been incredibly happy if I just won any medal whatsoever. You know, there, there's that old saying, you know, just being on the Olympic team, it, it, you've made it. And there's totally. some truth to that. You know, you try to feel that way, but that competitive spirit, it's in you. I mean, that's how you get to the top of any sport. So when you're in the Olympics, um, you really want to win a medal and you want to do better than a bronze. And if you can, that's wonderful. Um, the experience of being part of the Olympics without competing is just an unbelievable, um, feeling, you know, to be part yeah. of such a huge event. Yeah. I can um, imagine. But once we started competing, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to win some medals. And like I said, I did better than I ever expected to, our, our team did better than, than anybody predicted for us. Um, mm -hmm. we, we beat the, wow. the Chinese team, which was the number one team in the world in 83. Yeah. And so I think it was a big surprise for all of us. And then we went on to win some individual medals as well. And, yeah. you know, people ask what's the, that defining moment from the games. Mm -hmm. And for me and for the rest of my teammates, it's gotta be, you know, when we all sit up there together on the victory stand and, and we won for the first time, you know, yeah. as a team. And that was just incredible. Oh, I bet. I imagine. Great. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Man. So I understand there's like two crazy gymnastic moves that kind of bear your name. Yeah. Um, I, I, can yeah. you tell us about them and then demonstrate them? I cannot demonstrate them anymore, so we're going to have to have uh, Brian pull some clips and show show the audience. But um, uh, one of them, the demonstration, but oh, yeah, I'd like I to know more about them. Be. One was called the Gaylord Flip, and the other was called the Gaylord Two. And the way you get a trick named after you in our sport is you have to compete it internationally successfully, and then it gets named after you. Yeah. But the Gaylord okay. Flip I learned as a freshman, and it was literally a dream I had. I woke up one morning, and it was one of those visions I had of me on high bar, my favorite event. And basically instead of doing a release move on one side of the bar, which was what everybody was doing at the time, mm -hmm. I thought, wow, I bet you, you can flip over the bar and rotate one and a half times and catch it on the other side. And right. so I came into the gym in the morning and I told coach Sherlock, Hey, I had this dream. I want to try this. And he said, let's put it in the spotting belt. And we did. And I caught it on the third try. And it was, wow. uh, it was just so right. cool. And it was exactly how I envisioned it. Long story short, I couldn't keep doing that trick um, because it was very similar to the compulsory routine dismount, not to get too right. technical, but it had the same tap. And so it yeah. messed it up. And okay. I ended up saying, okay, well, if I can go forwards one and a half times over the bar, I could also do it the other direction and just put a half twist on it. And that became the Gaylord too. And that's the one that I competed in the Olympics. So wow. That's kind oh, of cool. That's fantastic. I would have had so many yeah. broken bones if I tried that. <laughs> well, <laughs> it can be a dangerous sport, but nowadays they have really great uh, safety equipment. They have foam pits that you can land in instead of landing on the floor or potentially yeah, right. your head. <laughs> and then we used to have spotting belts where if you were going to hit the, the high bar, the coach would yank on the rope just in time right before you hit. So there's all sorts of mechanisms in place to learn skills. And then yeah. once you have them down, well, then you take all the safety stuff out of there. No, oh, awesome. That's pretty cool. Um, obviously, yeah. as part of your Olympic experience, you actually, you kind of led out the team um, during actually the kind of opening ceremony. Uh, that must have felt incredible. The opening ceremonies uh, were amazing for several reasons. One is just the magnitude of the Olympic Games and you've arrived, you've made it, and you're walking into the LA Coliseum, which was where it was in 84. And there's 100,000 screaming fans and there's, you know, athletes from every country in the world represented there. So the magnitude of the event is huge. But for me, there was one very special moment is when they were lighting the torch 
Uh, nobody knew who was going to be lighting it um, that year. It's a big mystery. And uh, President Reagan at the time came over the loudspeaker and said, ladies and gentlemen, here comes the torch, please stand. And we were on the field. So it was very hard for us to see who was running the torch until the runner actually came by us. And as he did, my jaw dropped because this was the same athlete that I did my fourth grade uh, elementary school report on. Um, and it was my first time as a youngster knowing what the Olympics was all about. Mm -hmm. And here that same person is running the torch to light it at the Olympic games. It was Rafer Johnson and Rafer yeah. Johnson was the famous oh. decathlete uh, yeah. athlete, Olympic gold medalist. And there he was lighting the torch to the games that I'm competing in. And, uh, That's it was just a really cool, surreal moment. Yeah. I can imagine. Very, I can yes. imagine. Yeah. It yeah. gave me the chills. Yeah, That's serendipity, awesome. you know, <laughs> makes you wonder yeah, what's, sure. what's out there working that you have zero control oh. over, but it was just magical. Totally. Very cool. I got to meet him after the Olympics. We were on a um, uh, Princess Cruise Lines. Uh, there was like an Olympic theme on there and his family was there. And my family was there. And I told him the story and he was such a nice guy. He, he recently passed away the, uh, about a year and a half ago and one, one of the kindest people I've ever met. And uh, he heard the whole story and he put his hand on my shoulder. He goes, Mitch. You keep telling that story. I like it a lot. And I get the word out there. And I told him I was, I was sharing it in the speeches that I gave. And he liked that a lot. So that was very oh, cool. awesome. That's, That's incredible. Great. <laughs> well, in mm -hmm. order to qualify and be at the Olympics, it means that you're within the best in the, in the world in your chosen sport, right? And so that must be an incredible feeling to be one of those, you know, how many people are on a team? Like 10? Or is it a few there's, more? Or? There's six of us. Yeah, there was, well, there's seven, but the seventh person is the alternate on the team. But I always tell people that that team in 1984, if it were anybody but the six people that were on that team, I don't, I don't think we would have won. I think we just had a very, very special bond as a group of, yeah. of guys and competitors. We were all competitors against each other before we got to the Olympics. There was college rivalries between UCLA, sure. Nebraska, and Oklahoma. And we happened to have a really great neutral coach, A.B. Grossfeld, who was not part of any of those schools. And he knew the kind of competitive fire that we all had. And we all wanted to be the best. And um, he sat us down before the Olympics and he said, guys, we have a chance to make history here. Let's put all of that college rivalry stuff behind us. Let's pull together, support each other. And we're going to do far better with that kind of attitude um, than trying to go for individual medals. And yeah, he was absolutely did. right. And he, and he also said, besides, yeah. you guys do good as a team. It sets you up for, you know, all those individual medals. But like I said in the beginning here, the defining moment for all of us was being up there on the victory stand as a team. It was just uh, an incredible, incredible feeling. Yeah. And that's the thing, I suppose, with you going there and competing and doing so well and then winning those medals, both individually and as a team, then surely then that's kind of your kind of validation for being chosen and for being part of that team in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. You, you definitely feel validated. You feel like everything was worth it. All the, all the hours that you spend in the gym. And I think the coolest part of it beyond everything is that a vision that you had at 12, 13 and 14 years old, just materialized. The dream actually right. just happened. And that's, yeah, yeah. that's powerful, man. I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. know how many times, in life, people get to do that. But I, I'd imagine it's fairly rare for most people. It is for me. Right. I mean, yeah. it happened then. And, you know, there's very few things in life where I could say, here's a 10 year goal or a 15 year goal. And sure. boom, there it is. It happened and all, all the stars aligned and it worked. So awesome. um, any, on any given day, I think, you know, you're, you're at such a high level, all these athletes. I mean, th my best example of this is the hundred meter dash. All right. You've got eight of the fastest guys in the world. And they're winning by one thousandth of a second, with the exception of Usain Bolt. <laughs> he <laughs> right, kind of blew right. everybody away. But um, for the most part, any of those guys could win on any given day. They're all that talented. And it just comes sure. down to who, who's going to get it on that particular day. Yeah, totally. All right. Totally. Well, you talked about mm -hmm. the elation of being, you know, on the podium, so to speak. Right. So yeah. but, uh, you know, I don't know if many people know about the self-sacrifice that goes into, mm -hmm. you know, getting to that point in life where, you know, you're, you're working at that dream that you had and, right. you know, boom, like that, that whole thing. Can you tell us about some of the self-sacrifice that you had to, to deal with to get to that level? 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you know this path well too. You know, having gotten Grammys and the hard work that goes in for all of that. And I think nowadays, you know, you you look around and it, it seems like people think you just put a few posts out on social media and boom, you hit it. <laughs> and uh, exactly the, that that's foreign to me. Uh, and I think it's foreign for anybody who's who's really put in the effort and the work over many many years to get to a certain level. But like I said earlier, it's something that I love to do, even though it wasn't all fun and games. I mean, there is dedication right. involved and there's disappointing things that occur along the, along the way. Mm -hmm. But sure. I think that's that's like the beauty of it all is that that's how you grow and that's how you find out what you're capable of. And, yeah, you know, totally. you have these coaches and mentors mm -hmm. who can help you along that path and really keep you in the game, keep you mentally focused. And I would say that mentally um, and focus is probably the number one thing anybody needs to have on, on a on a long term right. journey and commitment right. to the journey and you know and and have a good mental attitude uh, even through the down times and when you have disappointments and so called failure which is the silliest thing in the world because right. everyone's going to fail on the road to success right um, yeah, but you can't look at it that way you have to yeah. you learn from that's it and you and you figure out what you need to do to change things and and move forward but that's what makes right. you stronger yeah. in many respects isn't it. Yep, absolutely. And it builds your character too, because I think once you experience those disappointments, you know, you got the fork in the road where a lot of people would just give up and say that this is not for me. I don't want to ever feel that feeling again. And I think it takes a special person, personality, mental strength to say, screw it, man, this is my dream. I'm not giving up on it. And I'm going to keep yeah. moving forward. And even if that happens right. again, I'm going to pick myself up and do what I need to do to hopefully prevent it from happening in the future. Um, right. In sort of a similar vein, was there ever really a time when actually you thought, do you know what, this isn't really worth it? I've, I've kind of, I've kind of, I've like sort of had enough. I'm kind of walking yeah. away from it. Yeah, there was one in particular reminding me of now, and it was when I was 17 and a half, and it was before I even went to UCLA. We, I, I competed in the junior nationals, and that was the first time I competed nationally ever. And I think my reputation, which was very accurate, was. I was a very um, naturally talented gymnast, but I had zero fundamentals, zero technique. I was kind of a, I mean, people call me a cowboy and that kind of stuff and <laughs> undisciplined. And yeah, he's got all the fancy skills, but he's just, you know, not refined and he's not your typical gymnast that we're looking for to go to the top. But all, oh, all those insecurities I started with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I did have some cool tricks, like, you know, people noticed that that guy can do, you know, he could do a double back off, you know, high bar and rings and, you know, junior in high school. But anyways, when I got to the national championships, it was in New York and um, I saw all these gymnasts in the warmups that I had seen in magazines or on television. And I got completely intimidated and lost my focus and uh, just felt like I didn't belong there. And, and everything that I heard everybody say about me, I started to believe and I wasn't worthy of being there and all this. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the competition, the top 12 got to stay for a two week training camp with the head of USA Gymnastics. And it was kind of mm -hmm. you guys are being prepped now to go on to the Olympic level next year yeah, yeah. and being groomed for that. And so they announced the uh, and by the way, I screwed up 50 percent of my routines, 50 percent of them made mistakes on it. And I, I hear the announcer and I took 13th place. And so I missed, I missed the top 12 by the one spot and I literally blew 50% of my routines. So I walked away going, well, the good news is I belong in that group. If I just did what I was capable of. And the bad news is, is, is my mental right. focus and self-worth was in the toilet. And that was one of those points where I felt like quitting because my parents had flown out there. I had relatives from New York come watch and, I just felt like I let everybody down and I didn't yeah. want to ever feel that again. Uh, so well, that was one of those turning points. Oh, bless. I, well, I, I suppose that if you're going to kind of mess up in, 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 in so many ways, that's a really big stage to do it on, isn't it? It is, you know, it's a big national stage. And, and that's the other thing, you know, you learn that um, how important it is, no matter what stage you're on, you have mm -hmm. to be so mentally focused while you're competing. You yeah. try to duplicate what you do in workouts and in yeah, workouts, you get that, you know, the athlete zone that you've heard about, or yeah, that yeah, totally. tunnel vision or present moment awareness or flow, yeah, yeah. all those, all those things that mean the same exact thing, where basically you're blocking out everything around you and you're so oh, internally yeah, totally. focused on what you're doing. That's where you want to be. And you learn how to yeah. do that uh, or you don't, or you don't make it. Yeah, totally. Right, totally. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, 
I like to focus on the elation of it. So like what goes through your head when you're standing on the podium and you're hearing your anthem being played and seeing, you know, your country's mm-hmm. flag being raised. Like that must yeah, be it's, it's, like, it's oh, surreal, man. It's unbelievable. All that, it's like, yeah. All it's, that hard uh, work it's, paid it's, off, right? It's, it's, yeah. The reality sets in. And I always thought, um, I always thought I was going to cry up there. <laughs> That's what I thought. Cause <laughs> I'm a fairly emotional guy on certain things. Right. And I thought, sure. man, sure. I hope I don't like break down up there in front of the whole world. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, I've seen a lot of people do that. You know, it's, you're just so overwhelmed with emotion and uh, right. the, the exact opposite of it happened to me when I was on the stand. Cause I saw a couple of my teammates, you know, get teary eyed and I just had sure. the widest smile that I've ever seen on my face. And I was just, so happy just taking it all in in, almost in disbelief like it actually happened and here we are and and you're right it's like yeah all the hard work paid off but it was just enjoying the moment and loving every every second of it that's how it felt awesome great Uh, um a couple of moments ago you spoke about obviously the japanese team and the chinese team and there was a lot made in the press about the rivalry actually sort of between you between the american team and the chinese team and the japanese team um how mm. real was that to you as actually part of that competition was it anywhere near as fierce as actually the press had made out at the time i think that uh no, to answer your question no i think everyone's so focused on on what they came to do that you, it's yeah. not like a, a football game where you're going out to bash the other guys and tackle them <laughs> it's not that interactive it's you got to go out and do your job and and the yeah. judges put the scores up and you see where it mm-hmm. falls but we had I'll tell you some of the greatest memories I have on the Olympic journey was going to Japan and going to China and going to Russia and, and actually right. hanging out with the athletes you yeah, know, yeah. after the competition and realizing, yeah. hey, we're all the same. You know, we're well, all exactly. yeah, yeah. competitors You're all actually, and we love yeah. competing. And yeah, so I think a lot of that rivalry stuff has to do with, you know, publicity and the press, you know, course it gearing is, yeah. it up for the competition. Yeah, yeah very sure, much sure. So. That makes total sense. Did you ever make, make good friends <laughs> with any of the uh, yeah. opposing athletes? Yeah, in fact, some of them have moved to the states. They opened up their own gymnastics centers, um, so it's yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I'm not buddies with any of them now, but mm-hmm. back then I was. I mean, Lin Ming from China and Tong Fei and uh, Li Yuezhu. I mean, the Chinese. We competed with the Chinese in Hawaii, in LA, and in Beijing. So we got to know them really, really well. Yeah, and right. not so much the Japanese athletes. The, the Russian athletes. We had a couple of dual meets where we met them and. They were super cool also. And I think it's that um, camaraderie of respect. Like, you know what yeah. everybody's going through to get to those levels. And, and so yeah. that's right. all you care about is, is the respect that you have for, for people on the same path as you. Totally, totally. Right. Well put. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, occasionally so, that happens. Yeah, occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 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 after basically the 84 Olympics, the, um, I believe there was a promotional tour that, that was organized by like the US government. Um, how was that? And for how long did it last? There, they went in a few phases. I mean, the first one, there was the Olympic tour where all the medalists got to go around to, you know, Disney World <laughs> to um, to different cities across the country and have ticker tape parades. And that was just yeah, yeah. unbelievable, that experience yeah. there. And then USA Gymnastics then did an actual like 25 city tour. And that was just pure fun just to go out and celebrate with people and fans and, and share the moment of the success. And you know, that was the same year Mary Lou Retton won. So she's like a, right. the hugest star on the planet at that time. So hmm. anywhere she went, if we were involved in that, it was, you know, 10 times the amount of people that were there. And, yeah. and uh, the fun factor was always there. But we just did a bunch of exhibitions and shared the, the sport of gymnastics with, with people around the country. And it was a blast. Had so much fun. It lasted wow. for about two years, to answer your wow. question. And then we did yeah. oh, wow. another one in 88. We came back and did some more. Um, but I was really retired after, after 84 competitively, I was burned yeah. out and my body really couldn't take it anymore. So these exhibition things were just having fun and doing yeah. a little bit watered down routines, but still just enjoying the moment. And then I had all these other opportunities that were happening that I had never expected after the Olympics, TV shows and movies and endorsements and things like that. And that was a whole different direction I had gone in at that time. Awesome. I yeah. love those. And you were named by uh, <laughs> President Ronald Reagan as a member of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports in, yeah. I think it was November of 85, yeah. right? So how long did you sit yeah. on the council and did you meet Ronnie? 
I did. I did. You <laughs> that did. Was, wow. That's pretty what cool. Was he like? Yeah. He, super, super genuine, super nice. Very, I met him and Nancy at the same time, right after oh, the wow. Olympics. They were there yeah. in Los Angeles wow. before we went on that medalist tour. So we all got okay. to get our pictures taken with them. Um, I didn't meet him when we did the, the President's Council for Phys Physical Fitness and Sports. George Allen, uh, the great coach from uh, Redskins was there and it, he was kind of in right. charge of that whole thing. And then yeah. I also did another term with uh, George Bush Sr. And so, um, oh, wow. it, yeah, it was kind of cool because, you know, I, I'd never done anything like that in, in, in my life. I was an athlete, so I wasn't really a fitness guy, um, yeah, but right. the transition was so similar for all of us. It's just about healthy lifestyle and I think the most I got about, out of it was helping kids and going through uh, the school programs and, and trying to motivate kids to get into shape and, you know, make healthy choices. And even if you yeah, weren't yeah. going to be a, a star athlete, you can still be in good shape. And it was yeah, totally, pretty absolutely. rewarding, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. That's um, great. Yeah. You, you spoke earlier about some of your kind of television appearances and, and guest roles. Um, do you want to kind mm -hmm. of tell us a little bit more about some of those? Yeah, I mean, they, they were just a blast. The, the funniest thing for me was going to something like, it was called A Night of a Hundred Stars, and it was a yep. big event out of New York. And we were um, featured with the Pointer Sisters, which were a huge group at the time. Yeah, yeah, um, right. And, you know, it got to meet every famous actor in the world and TV stars. And, and here we were, this Olympic team that was performing with the Pointer Sisters, on stage and of course we got to hang out backstage with everybody people were coming up to us just so genuinely thanking us for the feeling they got from watching us in the olympics and that blew my mind because yeah, yeah. you know people like robert de niro and morgan fairchild christopher walken wow. you know the, the, wow. these people were like just so cool and like here we were and i'm like in awe that you know we're around all these big celebrity names and everything so that was kind of trippy, to, to be honest yeah. with you. And then we got to do some TV shows. We did, if you remember the show, Different Strokes, we were all yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, I remember Different Strokes. Uh, yeah. Hollywood Squares, we did. We used to gather over here. a lot of fun strokes, stuff yeah. like that. What's that? Hollywood Square. Hollywood Squares, yeah. that was one of my favorite funny shows to watch. But like, that was technically, a great you, show, yeah. Technically, like, you started your movie career with Logan's Run way back in 76, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> yes, people think, that it, people think that it was the Olympics that got me into American Anthem, but I was an actor at 13. You're right. Well, right, right. <laughs> well, Logan's so, Run. Speaking, yeah. it, speaking of American mm -hmm. Anthem, like, what was it like starring in your own movie with Janet Jones, of all yeah. people? Like, yeah, it was wow. a trip, man. I mean, I, I mean, all, all kidding aside, I wasn't really an actor, but I did do Logan's Run way back when they right, needed some right. gymnasts in the scene where they escaped the, I forget all the technical terms, but they got out of out of the bubble and, and into town. But Farrah right. Fawcett was in the scene, got to meet her. I was a huge fan of Charlie's Angels growing up. Wow. So that was a, oh, a sure. lot of fun. But the way American Anthem happened was the director, Albert Magnoli, had directed Purple Rain with Prince, and, and he was studying uh, gymnast for his gymnastics movie. And uh, he, he saw me in the Olympics and he said, you know, I'm going to get this guy. We, I could teach him to act, and he's already got the skills down as a gymnast. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, uh, David Geffen was, and Dean Pitchford uh, from Footloose, if you remember him, they did, yeah, he did yeah. the whole soundtrack for Footloose. So they were doing this other uh, project where they were going to get Tom Cruise to star in a movie called Parallels, and they wanted me to double Tom Cruise, and they were going to give me a small role in the in the movie, like a cameo almost. Yeah, yeah. And Albert okay. Magnoli convinced me, screw that. You come over here, you'll be the star of my movie, and we'll teach you how to act, and it'll be your thing. And, and that's what I ended up doing. Uh, don't know if it's the right move or the wrong move. It doesn't matter at this point in life, but I had a blast. I mean, it was a, so much fun doing the movie. It didn't do as well as anybody had wanted it to do box office wise, but the experience was fantastic. And I mean, young gymnasts today know me from that. They have no clue yeah. what I did in the Olympics, but that, that it's like a, a little bit of a cult movie in the in gymnastics world. So that's kind of fun. Right. Right. But that's yeah, actually yeah, never right. a bad thing anyway, is it? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Um, and kind of after that, you went on. You went on to do some stunt work in Batman Forever and Mortal Kombat. Um, I did. I yeah. suppose it was the gymnastics that actually kind of led itself into that. Yeah, for Batman Forever, uh, Chris O'Donnell was Robin in that one, and he was, you know, obviously a, a trapeze guy, as the story yeah, goes. Right, yeah. Yeah, he's and so they needed somebody to do that. 
Exactly. And so I knew, I right. knew who the Batman double was. And he said, you know, you're the perfect height for Chris O'Donnell. They're looking for a yeah. double. Do you want to do this? And I said, well, what does it entail? And he said, well, you got to do the trapeze stuff, but you can learn that no problem with your background. Um, and they might have you do some other stuff too. And little did I know I was going to do everything <laughs> for oh, wow. I mean, with the exception of a couple of scenes, I, I did the, yeah. the bulk of all of his stunt work. And mm -hmm. some of it wow. was far more dangerous than I, than I had ever known. In fact, I'll just tell you a quick story. By the way, that was a blast also. I had a, an incredibly fun time shooting that movie. But on the last day of the shoot, we had to do a scene where Robin is driving in the bat boat and we went to Long Beach at nighttime. It's like 3 a.m. in the morning by the Queen Mary and we've got helicopters flying and the whole thing. And, and my job was to basically drive the bat boat uh, parallel to the harbor for about, I don't know, 300 yards or so at full speed. And as yeah. I was doing that, they were going to set off all these explosives because mm -hmm. if you remember the movie, you got the Joker and two, two face and the, I can't remember who the other guy was now. The Riddler. The Riddler yeah, and Two-Face were playing Stink Your Battleship. And they were yeah. trying to blow up Robin as he drove through the thing. Well, anyways, I talked to the stunt coordinator and the explosive guys before I got in the boat. And I said, hey, what, what's to make sure those things don't hit me as I'm going through? And they said, don't worry. Just take your boat, point it at the barge where the film crew is. You just point it straight at that. We had divers go down and put them at various spots. And as yeah. the boat passes... The guys are on the barge, and as soon as your boat passes, they hit the, the detonator, and it blows up right behind you. But the camera angle, it'll look like it's right next to you. I'm like, yeah. okay, cool. So anyways, <laughs> I start going at high speed in the boat, trusting that everything's going to work. Last day of the shoot, I'm going at like 45, 50 miles per hour in this boat. The thing's like shaking. They like the pyrotechnic thing. There's fire coming out the back. And as I'm going through it, there's this weird feeling I had that these damn explosives are getting closer and closer to me as they're going off. And I'm thinking that's just in my head. And long story <laughs> short, by the time I got towards the end of the, the thing, the 300 yards, one hits the boat right underneath the boat. I wow. hear this huge explosion. I fly up in the air. I don't know. It wasn't super high, maybe 10 feet off the ground. It, it lands in the water and I'm now motorless. And I look back and the whole bat tail of the boat, had blown up and flown off. And I look at the barge and I'm like waving. Everyone on the barge are looking up in the air, thinking it's me and my with the cape on and everything <laughs> floating down to the water. <laughs> it freaked me out. And I'm smelling fumes in the water. And finally I had a rescue boat come over and get me. But it was just it was a weird weird way to end a movie shoot. Oh, yeah, it took wow. me. That's as, pretty crazy. Yeah. As actually looks at like Robin would say himself, yeah, holy cow, Batman. That's right. That's right. Holy cow, man. <laughs> but, uh, no, I do realize I did I did Mortal Kombat after that, but that was just a few gymnastics type stuff. But the stunts is not right. for me. It, it's very dangerous, man. A, a huge respect for the, what those guys do, man. They risk their lives in a lot of situations. And even as, as careful as you want to be. And you know what happened was that the, the tide, because the divers did put those explosives down in the right place, but the yeah. tide moved the, moved the top part of where the explosive went off in the current. Right. And it just, okay. it wasn't accurate is what happened. Yeah. Right. Anyway, at least that's what they told me. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've always and imagined said, it's pretty glamorous. And, and, and please, yeah. And please don't sue us. We're going to give you a huge stunt adjustment, which is an extra bonus for the work that you do. <laughs> right. Of course. I've always imagined it's pretty glamorous to be a stunt man. And like, you know, you just told us about some pretty dangerous stunt. Were there any ones that yeah. you thought were impossible or did you turn any roles down because you know, the, the stunts were too much. No, I, I, I honestly decided after that, I didn't, I didn't really want to do it anymore. You know, I just, it, it wasn't for me and I got hurt a lot. I mean, there, you get hurt a lot. There's things okay. that happen and, you know, aches and pains, broken bones. And I mean, there was one scene where it wasn't me in the scene, but I watched it happen. And I was like, Oh my God, thank God. It's bat the Batman double right now. But they did one of those blow up things where Batman gets buried. And then the next scene is, He's supposed to pull Robin out of the, the thing out of the, it's just tons and tons of foam and sand and whatever. The guy got buried pretty deep and it took a long time to get him out of there. He was fine. But if you have any claustrophobia at all, yeah. good God, I don't know. I don't know how you get through that. You basically just got buried alive and you're, you're waiting for the crew to get you out of there. And it took a long Jeez. time. Right. Yeah. Scary stuff. But That's very scary is. stuff. That's why the, that's why the, uh, 
the actors who are making six million bucks a movie, you know, they're not doing that. They're they're putting the stunt guys in there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, mm. After you did the um, the kind of stunt work, um, have you used your fame for any causes that have been quite close to your heart? Well, I've always done that kind of stuff. I've always done charity work and, uh, you know, make a wish foundation is one of the yeah. ones that was super important and wonderful. And yeah, I hosted so a, a charity event in Beverly Hills about eight years in a row, which for uh, Vista Del Mar, which were for under underprivileged kids, kids were on the wrong track and it was raising money for them to help rehabilitate them. And, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff is super important. And if any I mean, I, I don't even consider myself a celebrity. I mean, it was an athlete. But if anybody who has any notoriety whatsoever and you can use that to help make the world a better place, my God, you got to do it, you know? Yeah, totally. You got to be out there helping. You know, it helps if you have a cause that you're super passionate about. But there's so many right. great things, golf tournaments. And, and I mean, David Marish was a guy who invited me on hundreds of, you know, charity golf events where we raise money yeah. for different causes. And those are all incredibly great and wonderful things to do. Did you actually win any? Never. Yeah. <laughs> Every, in, fact, in fact, everybody couldn't believe how, how, how bad I was. They're like, you're an Olympic gold medalist. How come you can't golf? And I said, I was a gymnast. I'm not a golfer. I mean, come on. And I do this like once a month. So it's pretty right. funny. But every now and again, I'd have one good shot. You know, thank God they do scramble because you get to contribute every now and again with your one, your one good shot and you hope you have you know, a scratch right, golfer right. on your team. So you, so you do all right, but it's all about having fun and, and yeah, raising totally. money for charity. So you can't totally, go wrong. Totally. Oh, yeah, awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, in the last few years, yeah. you're, you're in the Olympic hall of fame, you're the UCLA hall of fame, the international Jewish sports hall of fame. Yahoo named you the seventh U best U S gymnast of all time. And you're right. the first American to ever score a perfect 10 in the Olympics. That's quite a legacy to leave Mitch. Can you well, talk about you. what that feels like that. inside? Well now, well, now that you put it that way, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Stack it feels them all great, up. man. I, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm getting older now, so it's it's nice to look back and and see that you did something that that is meaningful. And I mean, I know how it felt at the time, but it, when you have years and even decades that go by now, and you can look back at something that you did that was so special, like I said. For me, you know, it was all about our team making history, and we, we had never won a gold medal as a team in our sport. So that was an right. incredibly cool thing to have happen. It still hasn't happened since then, by the way. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had some individual gymnasts that have had huge accomplishments, um, but yeah. as a team, it hasn't right. happened. So that's pretty darn cool. So, um, what, but you, think you mentioned those, those moves that are named after me. That, that to me is on right. par with, with the gold medal because, you know, people still do those skills, and that, that to me makes me feel like I left my mark on the sport, yeah, you know, totally. with creativity and innovation. And that's, I, I love that. Yeah. Totally. totally. Yeah, I love that stuff too. That's great. Yeah. Um, well, thanks. One of, one of the things that you've gone on to be is an advocate for child allergy awareness. Um, is that something that's yeah. a personal mission for you or is it something that's, that's kind of affected you in any way? Yeah, big time. You, you've done your homework. I, I wasn't expecting that question, but yeah, both of our uh, young kids are have severe uh, peanut allergies and tree nut allergies. And so ah. I had no idea about it at all. Like it, I, I don't have one, so I never knew it was so prevalent. I never knew that people had to deal with this. But when you have yeah. young kids and, and they have severe allergies and, and they can go into anaphylaxis, I mean, you've got a serious situation on your hands. Oh, yeah, and, totally. So I think awareness is the key, you know, and helping, helping, sure. helping parents and educating people on how to raise kids that have these allergies. It's super important. Um, and yeah, our son's been to the ER three times. So it, it's the yeah. real deal and it's scary. And, yeah. you know, if I can do anything to help create awareness for people to make better choices or to to help like get EpiPens in schools. I mean, we, my wife and I, I mean, when, my wife, when she goes full bore on something, look out, man, you know, you got the mama bear <laughs> and yeah, uh, there great. was something happening in, where we live in Austin, Texas, where EpiPens weren't even in, in the schools, you know, for emergency wow. use. And so uh, we got involved and, and we helped pass that. Um, and uh, that, that makes us feel like we contributed and, and, and helped to do some good out there. Oh, totally. Totally. That's really kind of worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I hear you're in Austin now and uh, a little birdie yeah. told me that you might be getting into the fitness market for men over 50. Have you started working on that <laughs> at all? 
<laughs> I've started on it. Yeah, you've got some good okay. uh, good birdies out there. But yeah, um, <laughs> I. I I, I work out all the time. I mean, it's, it's what's kept me not just physically fit, but mentally fit over the years too. It's like my go-to place for whenever right. I'm stressed out or whatever, I just go internal again and I, get, I work out and all of a sudden those problems just disappear. And so um, I know, you know, as you get older, it's harder to look a certain way, but I wanted to kind of combine for men over 50, um, you know, a new way of working out. And not just for the physical appearance, but also mobility, flexibility, and just longevity. So as we get older and older and older, we're still physically fit and we can still play with our kids and grandkids and, uh, mm -hmm. and feel healthy and alive out there. So, yeah, I got a new camera and uh, I'm kind of like toying in my head with, you know, the best program to put out there. But it's definitely a passion of mine. And, uh, yeah. yeah, keep on the lookout for that. Let's see what happens. Definitely will. And um, you, I suppose sure. um, from sort of a historical perspective, men over 50 haven't always been the most engaging in programs of actually that nature. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah. so, so, you know, right. so, so actually, again, it's actually kind of a very kind of worthwhile course, yeah. really. So, well, so kind of well done for that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think people, sure. as, as we get older, you know, you kind of give in to what your parents did or, the, or your grandparents did and you, and you, you kind of settle and you don't have to, I mean, you could really stay physically fit and active well into your seventies, eighties and nineties. I mean, you just have to make it a priority. And I think the main thing is, is you got to have the motivation and the internal drive to do it. But yeah, um, totally. I don't think it's ever too late to make that happen, by the way. I mean, even if you let <laughs> yourself go, there's a way to totally transform yourself, even if it's a little bit each and every day. When yeah, you look totally. back at an Olympic career, it's all about consistency and doing something right. each and every day towards the goal. Where yeah, your totally. goal, you know, could be to get healthy and just do a little bit each and every day towards that goal. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. I, I know awesome. that feeling uh, very, very well. <laughs> yeah. I know um, it too. I know it too. I mean, I've gotten out of the field before. It doesn't, doesn't feel good. Yeah. We're, yeah, well, we're all like, actually you know, men of a certain age, on, we, so. Yeah. <laughs> and when you, get, when you get hurt, like on the movie set or, you know, in, in gymnastics, I'm sure that it, the healing just, you know, it takes time, especially the yeah. physical part to, you know, to get back that strength and that ankle or that whatever is hurting yeah. you, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. And there's this great thing called modification nowadays. As we get older, you don't have to go for an Olympic medal. You don't have to be a champion gymnast. <laughs> if you have bad ankles, well, then you can work upper body. You know, if you have upper body injuries, you can become a cyclist. Like there's all these, there's so many. And if you don't want to do any of that, go for a walk. You know, there's, yeah. there's always exactly. something you can do, but I think it's just got to be part of your focus and part of your mindset and, and your identity of who you want to be as you get older. Well, one of the um, things that you touched on earlier was, was the coaching, right? Because, you know, mm -hmm. in, in my life, it's been, you know, to keep that consistency and stuff and keep my drive going and my focus on, on, the, on the ultimate goal, there has to be some kind of internal, if not external coaching. And I think that, you know, mm -hmm. in your case, I think, you know, your accomplishments are so stacked up that, you know, your coaches must have been just amazing and and strict at the same time to keep you, yeah. you know, as, as a kid, you want to just go everywhere. Right. You know, so as, right. as an adult, you right. have to focus. And, and I'm thinking that, you know, tell us, I just want to hear a little bit more about your coaching and how they might've influenced all of your life outcome. Yeah. And I've had some in incredible coaches along the way. And I mean, I, I think, you know, like we're saying, it starts with the internal drive and the internal focus to want to be able to get there. And then when the coach sees that drive and passion in you, my God, they want to give you their all, you know, because they know it's going to go somewhere and they know it's worth yeah. it. And um, it, it's kind of this great synergistic relationship. But, um, you know, I, I, I had some coaches that were um, not the right coaches for me. And I think, yeah. you know, we both knew it at the time. And, you know, you mm -hmm. kind of figure out who who you jive with and who works best. Like I was saying earlier too, it's very much mental. So your coach right. has to know you <laughs> mentally too and what motivates you and how to focus you correctly and how to get you to that next level. Yeah. But Kurt Thomas, I mean, he, he's the first name that comes to mind because he passed right. away about a, about a year ago and it was very, very, very sad too early, much too early. Yeah. But I am now part of uh, the Kurt Thomas Foundation. I'm a board member. Uh, and okay. in fact, we have a meeting tomorrow on it. We have a big event coming up in September and we're going to raise money and we're going to, um, we're going to give a scholarship to a deserving young athlete and, you know, yeah, who, awesome. who maybe doesn't have the funds to keep training. And, and, uh, that's going to be a wonderful, wonderful cause to keep his legacy going. But, 
he was one of the best coaches I've ever had. And, and he saw in me a lot of things that I don't even think I saw in myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're working out and you feel like you're giving it your all and you're pushing yourself to the limit, it's that great coach that strategically gets you to an even higher level of effort by mm -hmm. knowing what you're capable of. And he yeah, was one of those guys, but my God, we, uh, we did some incredible training sessions that I'll never forget where literally I thought I was just, I couldn't do any more. And, you know, we'd go for a walk, we'd talk about stuff and he'd, he'd set my mind on that goal of where I wanted yeah. to be. And just that mental awareness, that mental focus got me back in the gym 10 minutes later to go to a whole new level of effort and output that results nice. in this building of confidence that, you know, you don't get to those levels without that extra push. No, so, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, coaches that's are incredible. awesome. That's incredible. That, that's pretty much what I was talking about. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. My um, pleasure. If our lovely audience want to know a little bit more about you, um, where actually can they find mm -hmm. out some information? Well, I'm like a, uh, an anti-social media guy right. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be hard to, to get my message out there I, I mean i'm basically on linkedin that's all i'm on right now i'm not on facebook or any or twitter or any of those or or instagram but i think you know if i if i really want to get the word out about you know men over 50 working out i'm going to have to start utilizing those platforms to just to yeah. get the word out mm -hmm. um but let's stay tuned. MitchGaylor.com is, is the URL that I have and anything awesome. that I end up doing will stem from there. So that's a, that's an easy one to remember. That is a very easy one. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. <laughs> well, Super thank you. Man. And this has been a very informative and fun episode. And I want to thank Mitch Gaylor for taking the time to be part of this uh, episode of My Right Stuff. Thank you to our sponsor, Tomes, yeah. which is a natural sleep and sound healing portal, helping people globally to get to sleep faster and stay asleep longer. You can find this piece of gold at www.tomes.com. That's www.t-a-u-m-m-h-o-m-s.com. And a big thank you to all of you who stream, download, watch, and support my right stuff. Please keep spreading the word. And I want to thank my distinguished co-host, Mr. Gareth Dighton. And our whole Thank My Right much. Stuff crew for making this podcast possible every week. Thank you very much, Toby. Um, yeah. Kind of, kind of actually, since we've actually been doing this, I've always basically said that you know um, that, that that whoever actually comes on this actually like sort of deserves a, a, some gold medals. But Mitch has brought his own tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that's yes, the Mitch. Best theory. <laughs> that's right mitch did bring his own yeah. that's awesome <laughs> well, well thank, thank you, you guys again, i mitch. really appreciate being on the show man this is a lot of fun thanks very much good luck with thank your you show much. Thank, thank you, you. and yeah. this has been another exciting episode of my right stuff be sure to tune in next week and every week for yet another adventurous episode i'm your host lord toby wright and remember to listen loud play hard and keep reaching for your dreams no style you lovely people and good night
Thank you for watching My Right Stuff. This episode was brought to you by Tones, a natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tones.com. That's www.tounmhoms.com.